So good morning, America, and good afternoon to those of you in Europe, and good evening to those of you in Asia. My name is Istvan Engel, and I've got the honor to uh, be the MC for the first uh, session today at the Gala Connected 2021 conference, uh, which is the $200,000 technology stack for 2021. Why LSP should stop developing redundant components and start co-investing in automation. Just a few guidelines before we start. I would like to introduce now very briefly the panelists. Uh, the panel is going to be moderated uh, by Konstantin Dranch and Mark Mitag. Konstantin, many of you know, is the founder of translationrating.ru and it's also a co-founder of CustomMT, where he is very busy. He's a, he's a very uh, well-respected presenter. Probably you have seen him before. Mark Mitag is head of the, Mark, of the Mitag QI Quality Informatics and founder an enthusiastic lead developer of Translate 5, the open source proofreading and post dating environment. Mark started developing software in 2000 and working in the IT centric part of the language industry in 2002. And if I understand correctly, he was also working earlier with one of the presenters, uh, Dr. Sturz. In 2009, he founded his company, Mittag QI, which focuses on building software and technical consulting for the language industry, Translate 5 being the main project. Uh, then we've got uh, the panelists, Adam Bittlingmaya, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of Modelfront, a passionate language learner and software engineer who earned his experience at Google Translate as well as Adobe, Google Play, and some startups. He, be, beyond the translation, his interests include input correction, language identification, transliteration, and synthetic data generation. Dr. Wolfgang Storz, is the owner of Transline. He's been in the industry for more than 30 years by now. And he's besides uh, working in the industry, he's also got some academic merits. And just a piece of interesting information, the first time I met him, it was in 2005 in, in Saarbrück in Germany in a PhD school on multimodal translation. Remy Bletla uh, is the CTO of Supertext since 2006 and developed the system of Supertext from scratch. He graduated from the Northwestern University in Chicago uh, with an MS in computer engineering and lived and worked in Manhattan for eight years. So I would like to pass the floor to Konstantin and good luck. Thank you, Ishwan. Good uh, day and morning, everyone. Today, we have an interesting panel on technology. For some reason, uh, when a technology panel assembles at uh, an industry conference, it's only men usually on the panels. Uh, today, we are suffering from the same uh, disadvantage. It's, uh, it's a very traditional panel. So uh, please welcome all the panelists. So Istvan already introduced all of us. Um, we, uh, there's no need for fun facts uh, about each and everyone uh, from our side. So uh, we'll quickly proceed to the introduction uh, of the uh, topic uh, and then to open in statements. Before we do, uh, I'd like to launch the poll. Uh, Alison, if you could help me and uh, get to know who is, in, uh, who is with us today, how much you invest in technology. And if you had a, a spare 200 bucks, 200,000 bucks, sorry, <laughs> uh, what you uh, would put it through. In the second question, please mark no more than three applicable options. And those of us who are panelists, we cannot vote. So while you are clicking and considering all these shiny options, I'll quickly go through the topic introduction. So here we go. This of course started uh, with uh, a research project in uh, Germany, uh, where I asked uh, with my uh, collaborators, uh, what are they developing uh, this year? And it turns out that most of the middle-sized uh, translation companies in Germany are developing quite the same things. Uh, not only in Germany, everywhere you go, you would see people developing customer portals, uh, business management systems with invoicing. Um, 
in Germany specifically, uh, terminology tools and review tools are very popular. So there are software teams inside uh, language services providers that try to make the providers um, very strong in technology, but a lot of re development is redundant. Does it have to be so? Uh, does it have always the, to be that uh, teams develop uh, the same class of software over and over again in Germany, the United States, uh, in uh, the Arabic world, wherever? Maybe it's better to collaborate and pull up the resources to create at least the components uh, or some uh, things that everyone's using, like CAT tools, like the TMS, uh, together. And a great example here uh, with us today is the originator of the uh, panel, Mark. Um, so Mark has developed an uh, open source tool, Translate 5. It's not the only open source tool on the market these days. Uh, uh, you can find many options. You have TMS, machine translation, uh, QA checkers, such as the language tool. Um, some of them are quite popular, but none of them are as popular as, uh, for example, WordPress in the world, uh, world of CMS. This is, for example, the chart of um, Omega T downloads and every month there's 10,000 people who download uh, free open source cattle Omega T. So uh, there is some traction. Could it be more? There's a pull towards the open source. Uh, this week I spoke to people with, uh, at IKEA, at, at Red Hat, at some other corporations, big localization teams. They are developing components internally and they need, uh, of course, open source, right? So the buyers could do uh, with open source, the LSPs can do with open source, but most of the open source language technology that we're seeing developed today is quite far from the industry needs. There's the academic crowd, for example, ELG represented here with uh, hundreds of different technologies open sourced, but very few people use them. And then uh, a few tools uh, uh, we see here. Translate 5 is one of the uh, great examples here. Uh, maybe we start with the uh, story of Translate 5. Mark, please go ahead and uh, give us a, a little bit of a feeling what it feels like to, to be a leader of consortium of uh, companies that co-invest in an open source uh, tool. How does that work? Okay, thank you, Konstantin. So um, I think first I have to start a little bit with, with my motivation why I'm doing that. So um, at the age of uh, 13, I started to um, be very active in youth environmental movement in Germany. And uh, I always questioned, my, questioned myself, why um, are the people um, destroying uh, the planet? Why are the people um, destroying each other and uh, each other's countries and, and so on? Why, why are not uh, people helping each other in, instead of working against each other? And this led me um, to studying science of religion and philosophy in my 20s. And then uh, in a really early age, uh, I became a um, father and that uh, brought me back uh, to the bottom of, of things. And I had to earn money some way. And this brought me into the um, localization industry as a software developer. And um, then in 2009, as Ishwan always uh, already told, um, I uh, founded my own company and then I started to bring together um, the things I believe in and the things um, I needed to make money for. So this, this is the motivation behind um, what, what I'm doing with Translate 5 basically um, that I, I think and I'm convinced of that it's much more efficient for everyone and much more beneficial for everyone that we work together on things again uh, uh, instead of everyone um, working against each other or does the same thing again and again. And um, actually, it's, it's, I have to say it's a great fun to work together with, with different LSPs. Um, everyone brings in new ideas and um, this really speeds up uh, the, de the development and, and um, makes it much more simple to, to develop the software that really everyone can uh, benefit from. So. Um, I think that it's really um, can be really beneficial for LSPs and also for, for other companies who are investing more in language technology to actually work together on developing the basic tools they need. This is something that if you look in other industries, 
happens there um, usually that as soon as the technology in an industry becomes mature in a way that essential basic parts of this technology become um, open source components where um, a lot of different companies work together on each other uh, to, together. This is true in the cloud uh, environment, for example, SAP, Microsoft, Google, and so on, they cooperate a lot on, on software technology. All the bases for those systems are, uh, are uh, in, in, yeah, in many cases open source. Only in our industry, that's not the case. And um, this is something that can change. And I think that's, that is already changing with, um, and I think it should be possible in much more areas than it's um, currently the case in our industry. So we have a copy, we have language tool, we have Omega T, we have Transit 5, but that's only some areas where it should be possible. Is it getting stronger, uh, the support for open source? Um, are the number of com is the number of companies in your consortium supporting this open source development increasing? Yes, it's uh, it's very much increasing um, right now, especially in the la last half a year or year. But already before, it uh, it is increasing, and uh, and now um, we we formed a Translate Five consortium of uh, of ten LSPs who actually joined forces to um, develop everything that is that they still need in Translate 5 to switch essential parts of their, um, of their production load to Translate 5. Uh, and now after this de decision, it gets even more traction. So it's already uh, getting traction with industry and clients also who are getting interested and with other LSPs who might join. So. Thank you, Mark. Now uh, let's... Uh pass the flag to Dr. Sturz and ask Dr. Sturz, you have one of the biggest um, IT teams in the middle-sized um, translation companies in Germany. You have your own developers, a lot of uh, software uh, investment going from your side, but then you're also supporting uh, the open source, so third party uh, uh, through your company. Tell us a little bit about this setup why do you do this? What's the benefit for the business? Uh, and how do you balance between uh, the things that you do in-house and the things that uh, uh, providers like Mark do for you? Thank you, Konstantin. It's actually over 40 years that I've been in the business, that I've been in the business. I started Tanslan as a company 35 years ago, we'll have our 35th anniversary in a few weeks. Uh, unfortunately, no big party at this time, but maybe later of the year we'll have a party. Uh, I've been freelancing prior to starting Transline for around 10 years. So it's quite some time that I have been in this business and sort of very difficult to calculate. Looks like I'm the oldest in this around here in this group. Uh, the focus of my company, being an engineer and not a linguist, uh, I'm bilingual, so I tumbled into this uh, translation industry, not because I studied that, uh, I was an engineer, I worked as an engineer, but looking at this industry from the point of view from an engineer, I've always been very technology focused. Uh, I actually developed my first ERP system all by myself in the 80s, uh, the second ERP system in the 90s, uh, on own development again, being an engineer, I said so and wrote the code. Uh, the third ERP system uh, we started to develop in the uh, late 90s, in the early 2000s. Uh, actually, Mark Middag was involved to a certain extent there at that point of time already, so we have been knowing each other for quite some time too. Uh, and we are in the process of developing our fourth ERP system right now, and I'm not very much involved there anymore, but uh, it's fascinating to see how things have developed over all those years. And it's fascinating to see what kind of new developments have emerged over the last few years. It's extremely fast speed. Things are moving and things are going on. And it's uh, very exciting to be part of that, even though I'm not very active anymore as an own coder or programmer. Uh, the important question, why do we get involved in open source solutions like the one we're talking about today? Uh, we are spending quite some money actually in own development. Uh, you heard this uh, poll before, uh, we are 
slightly above 10% of our annual sales, which we are investing in technology altogether, in manpower, in hardware, in software, in software development, in actual developments, uh, in things like this consortium here. Uh, so I think we're on the high side as far as uh, investing that, in technology That's about $2 million, million dollars, right? Uh, we're talking about a figure of millions, not even 200,000. It's, it's seven digit figures, yeah. It's seven, definitely seven digit figures. Uh, uh, so it's quite some money we're spending there because I believe it is important to, uh, um, to, uh, to deploy this technology in order to survive in this industry. Uh, and people t t tend to ask me, hey, why are you cooperating with your competitors? If I look around here, I estimate, it's a rough estimate, that all of us together in this panel here, we have a market share in Germany of anywhere between two and three or four percent of the market. So let's join forces and let's work together as much as possible and as often as possible because the market is huge. Uh, actually, uh, you are all in the German market, but we never or hardly ever meet you uh, with our customers. We have our customers in this fairly strong group of language service providers. Uh, if we go together and we add up to three or four percent, I think you're like my competitors. I think we are buddies and we have to look at the same goal and the same objective. And why develop the same tool 10 times if certain parts of the tools can be developed jointly and together together with Mark Mittag. And I'm very thankful and grateful for Mark Mittag to picking up this initiative. Uh, maybe to get back 15 years earlier in the 2004 5s, Mark Mittag, you were involved there. We started with Fold for Open Language Technologies. That was the first initiative to develop something like a translation memory tool. It didn't work out because he didn't have somebody around like Mark Mittag who uh, pushed things. It were four or five companies. Beo was involved, a few other companies were involved. And it was thought, hey, we're talking about something that's nice to have, but there was, it, it, it simply didn't work out. And today with this consortium, with some financial figures in the background, uh, with somebody who's driving it, also from an economic point of view, it makes a whole lot of sense. And it's, as I said, exciting to be part of this. Thank you very much. Um, this is a good um, moment to show the results of the poll. So uh, Dr. Sturz invests 10% uh, of uh, his revenue into, into technology. Let's see what the participants are doing. The prevalent category I see here is four to 6%. So uh, let's say five, that's half uh, of uh, the proportion with uh, uh, Dr. Schurz, but we see also people who are investing 15 to 20 percent, and that's uh, uh, almost 20 percent of those who re responded. Wow! So I don't know. When I started, I worked at Nemsource, and people then would put I don't know three percent, four percent max in technology, one, two percent sometimes, and now in in this panel we see a significantly increased. Uh, 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 ratio less into people, more into technology, huh? All right, let's look at the second question. If you had a spare 200K, uh, what would you first build with it? So number one uh, is the internal uh, translation slash business management system. Number two, connectors and integrations with clients. By the way, uh, there are open source uh, business management systems, but uh, no one has open source connectors. Maybe that would be uh, an idea for innovators what to do next, do open source connectors. And uh, the next is machine translation, uh, products, subtitling, dubbing uh, systems. And a small percentage, 12% said that uh, they will invest into something else entirely. Interesting stuff. Uh, Remy, why don't you comment on this and also give us a little bit of the background, what you're doing with Supertext. You've already developed the internal something new uh something to um, differentiate mm, the company yeah exactly maybe uh, i'll start with the with the spending so we are very similar to transline we are also about between 10 and 15 percent depends on the year last year and this year is going to be super expensive because we are working on iso so the expenses have exploded a little bit and uh, what you just mentioned about the uh, open source connectors, I'm actually talking to Mark about this and I think he already picked up on that and is setting up uh, 
something to push that. Um, as Supertax, we do have a bunch of connectors uh, in the marketplace. They are open source, but they are open to our own CMS, so they're not as reusable as maybe what I will insert a fun, fa a fun fact here. Uh, there are, I think, 22 connectors from different translation companies to Adobe Experience Manager published yeah, on we, their marketplace. But there are maybe 80 <laughs> connectors developed uh, and no one knows about them, right? 80 companies built uh, the same software uh, in parallel. All this redundant effort is just mind-boggling. It is a bit crazy, in, in, indeed. Yes, uh, absolutely. So I think there is a massive uh, potential to... Uh, synchronize connectors, maybe with a mixed, um, maybe with some type of a mixed approach, because the connectors that we build, they do have speciality stuff that we provide to our clients in them that other connectors wouldn't have. But a lot of the code in there is definitely boilerplate. But maybe to uh, go up, go back around a little bit to to where we started the super text and uh, how we come to build our own EPR. Uh, was more historic. We started this company 15 years ago with two friends. And as we would say in Switzerland, was kind of a beer idea. You know? um, none of me, I was an engineer programming. My friend was in transportation. The other one was in marketing. So none of us had any clue about translation. And also we didn't start with translation. We started as an online copywriting agency. Um, and we just started, we built the website and figured, hey, maybe someone orders something, let's see, and then surprise, surprise, someone actually started to order. And that simple was actually a WordPress website, just mushroomed, uh, and I was just hacking away and, and building features as, <laughs> as, as we grew. And uh, we by accident actually got into the translation business. We are, we are based in Switzerland. And when we started the whole thing, or when, when this discussion came up, we were like, okay, there's definitely more than enough translation agencies in Switzerland really doesn't need us. But uh, customers kept asking, and then we figured, oh, come on, oh, okay, we'll, we'll also give you a translation. Can't be that difficult. <laughs> Turned out to be a little more complex than that. But uh, the translation business has uh, definitely grown at Supertext. So now we're doing about 70% translation, maybe 30% copy editing. And with that, the system in the background has just grown. So there was never a conscious decision. Uh, let's build an ERP system or, uh, I mean, maybe we grew bigger and we started to understand the marketplace. We did look at the tools, um, but that came actually quite late in the process, uh, like like Clunet and, and all these things. And um, we started to look at that, but at that point we were already at the decent size and had a very specialized workflow, super specialized system. And then it was always a bit hard to, to replace this. Um, and then we started into, we integrated the group share and Trados quite deep. Uh, they used us as a showcase. And yeah, ever since it's just the stuff has just you know, like these things tend to do. It it grows and grows and grows. And uh, at some point, I met uh, Mark Mitok at the conference, and I was like, okay, awesome. This is the missing piece that's missing in in our system. I always I'm I'm, I'm an engineer, so I always dream about building stuff myself, and I always dreamt about building an online CAD tool, but also. Uh, kind of was smart enough to realize, okay, if I start building my own CAD tool, this is, it's, it's going to be either it's going to be crap or failure, or I, I, I mean, I cannot compete with, with, with the big boys in, in something like this. And, uh, and then, yeah, met Mark and figured, hey, match made in heaven, no? <laughs> Good. So uh, this is how your open source connection, uh, why did you even take open source? Uh, instead of, I don't know, buying another group share license or XTM, Memsource, MemoQ, or whatever. Wh why open source? Um, I mean, at the time when, when this, I guess, this relationship started, uh, there was no online, like the online component of uh, group share really you know, wasn't there, or at least not what we were looking for. Um, Memsource and, and, and the other online tools obviously would have been a choice. Uh, 
I'm quite happy that we didn't make that. I mean, so, some of the suppliers, when they, like in the early days, they were totally targeting LSPs, but I think a lot of them kind of pivoted and they're targeting end client. And as an LSP, I'm really just not their core customer anymore, which which if if I put my whole company, I bite my company on a tool like this, and as a, as a LSP, uh, the, the CAD tool is, is central. And if I bet my company on a CAD tool and they say, hey, you know what? We realized LSPs are really not our customers. I'm, I'm dead in the water. And with an open source tool, I have, I have more flexibility, more possibility. And this, with Mark, we have a really cool working connection. We, we talk about features. So I have a lot of options to uh, get my ideas across. And also if, if, if Mark is not like, if something that we need a super text is not part of, uh, I guess, Mark strategy, we can just go in and, and build them ourselves. We did customize translate five for one of our new services quite dramatically, or oh, that dramatically is not the right word, but we customized it more than we could have done with, uh, with a tool, with a, with a closed, um, tool. And also just the lock-in is, is not as big, yeah. So the, the ability to, to develop around it. But uh, other than this, uh, open source, not open source is not a big um, factor for you, right? Uh, it's important to have I mean, it's, a it's, good product that you can influence. Yeah, I would say it, this, this is definitely a good, I mean, of course, if, if, if the product is not good, it doesn't help me if it's open source. So in, in first of all, it has to be good. I think that's the, one of the most important things. The ability to inf, um, influence it is important, the ability to customize it. Um, but I mean, it being open source definitely reduces the risk on my side of like a lock-in or of like complete dependence or like, completely setting on, on uh, betting on the wrong horse now. Good. Remy, thank you for your, uh, for your input. Um, Adam, uh, it's time for you to take the floor. Uh, the question for you, Adam, would be, you're doing uh, some very arcane uh, magical stuff around machine translation, right? Predicting risk uh, with Google Translate. So you are representing here the next wave of technology, right? Translation uh, management systems, CAD tools. All right, we already know this. We already know that the connector game is on. It's already finishing up. What is coming to the industry is stuff with uh, NLP, with data. On uh, the first day of the conference, we had this panel where uh, three companies had, I don't know, more than half of their business coming already from services other than translation, from training speech engines, from uh, labeling cats and dogs for Google, that kind of thing. So this type of service from dying translations to emerging services requires different kind of tool set. A lot of FinTech goes in there. The important part is the technology of the next $10 million for Dr. Sturz and the next uh, $10 million for Remy is not a cattle. What is it? What is the technology that needs to appear, which is not in here yet, that could be developed together by a conglomerate of companies uh, not doing the duplicate work and not copying each other or developing the same kind of thing in parallel, but instead collaborating to create um, tool that everyone can use between friends and competitors or co-competitors. What is it that needs to be done? Right. So, um, hi, everybody. I, I actually like to borrow here from linguistics. Sometimes linguistics can actually teach us uh, something in business. And one great dichotomy in linguistics is uh, between prescriptivists and descriptivists. So I'm not going to tell anybody what they need to do, but I, I would like to say sort of what I see uh, on, on more of that uh, you know, both general in the Bay Area and Bay Area SaaS and NLP in general, machine translation, machine learning. Um, and also I, I worked in Adobe or something, which is a, a different type and medical software, again, different type of, of uh, sphere. Um, so yeah, for us, open source is kind of the default and you kind of need a reason to make it um, closed, right? Um, and, uh, you know, as background, I worked in, uh, in Android, right, which is an open source platform. We were like, you know, 100 people at the time. Now, it's obviously, you know, the platform 
I guess, with the most users. Uh, I did the, uh, I mean, that the Google Chrome integration with Google Translate. Um, Google Chrome is open source. Chromium is open source, but of course those API integrations are not, right? So, and, and so the services are not, right? And so it's really interesting to think like, why did this thing end up open source? And it was super Thank successful. you for that integration, Adam. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, there might be other people here who curse us for it. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have, I think when we think about open, there's open source, but there's also open data, right? Paracrawl, these things are huge right now in the machine translation side. Um, open models. So like uh, University of Helsinki is putting all the, you know, they put out like a thousand models, right? So now you can just like download a machine, trans, a machine translation model that could run on a phone right? Um, open issues and support, like, can people just file a bug and it's public and everybody can see your, your dirt, right? Um, and um, yeah, open research. And um, you just talked about speech recognition, for example, right? So one change we saw was Apple. Apple did not do open research, right? They use open source, like in, in my MacBook here, it's using Unix, but um, they weren't like contributing back so much, right? And they had started to have a real problem that they could not hire a machine learning engineer or a machine learning researcher because all the machine learning researchers want to publish the stuff that they work on. Why? Because, you know, it helps them with their next job or they're just in it more for, you know, science, right? And so on. So I think there's a lot of reasons besides the cost stuff like recruiting, VizDev, for example, we've found some of our best and most interesting customers uh, going through the open source repos of some of the machine translation APIs. Um, and then the, the other things that, that uh, my colleagues here mentioned. So uh, sort of security is, is one of them too, right? So a lot of eyeballs looking at the code, but then the sustainability. So avoiding lock-in, avoiding uh, not just, so lock-in is bad enough, but the worst thing is when when you're locked in and then that company folds, the provider discontinues it or whatever, and then what do you do, right? So these are sort of the, the dynamics that, that I see. Um, and, and Well, that's so a, first, that, that, those are the reasons for open source. Um, uh, my question to you is, what should the industry do in open source, right? Uh, Okapi is super popular because it gives the file filters, which are open source. Language tool is super popular because it gives an open source QA. But right. these are the tools of the previous generation. What is the next generation of tools that we need in open source uh, in order to be ready for the challenges of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. AI and uh, and what's coming on in NLP? Right. So, well, uh, I think anything anything where it's per language, like per human language, is a great candidate for open source, right? Because like not every LSP can go maintain. Um, something for Swahili, right? Or so, Finnish uh, phraseology or morphology, right? Exactly, exactly. So um, that's, and that of course occurs in many, it, it could be like a sort of uh, like a Verifica Lexi QA kind of thing, right? Or it could be more in the machine translation side. Um, but that's, that's uh, an, a very um, obvious candidate, let's say. And, and, and again, I don't want to, prescribe so much as observe that this is already what's happened. Like language tool is like that. Spacey is like that. And, uh, and, and most of the, uh, you know, the machine translation libraries today are basically language pair agnostic. So uh, I think this, this reminds you of something. I think governments can even pay for this, right? Uh, this could be made into some business. I'll give you a story of Flito. Flito is a Korean company specializing in data and translations. And they just got uh, this year a contract. They have been, been like $6 million. They got a contract for $13 million from the government to build a big English Korean corpus, mm -hmm. right? So the company could package this uh, project as open source and get funding for, for this from the government to create language specific uh, stuff that now everyone will be able to use, hopefully. Good point, Adam. Anything else that comes to your mind? Yeah, I think what else should be open, open sourced and uh, uh, that we need uh, uh, for the future race? Well, I, I, always, I always compared TMS to the browser, right? 
it's sort of like the browser is what you do everything else through. It connects to everything else, right? And so for me, TMS was always the natural thing that, that should be open source, just looking at it from an outside perspective. And, um, and then the way that's usually monetized is of course connecting, connecting it to, to services um, that make money, right? So Chrome, Chrome is free and open source, but you know, they made it back on Google searches. Good. All right. So that was the kind of uh, series of opening statements. We're about 60% uh, into our time. I would like to open the floor for questions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, feel free to contribute questions through the QA tab, where it's easier to uh, notice them than in the chat. Uh, before we answer the questions from the floor, let me uh, shoot uh, Remy and uh, Dr. Sturz with a question which addresses the topic of today's uh, panel. Suppose you have a free $200,000 and you're starting a new translation company. What do you think it's better to buy and to build? How would you uh, spend your $200,000? Uh, I know, Dr. Soros, you have already $2 million spent per year. Revy, you probably spend also uh, at least uh, half a million. But let's say you, you, you're wearing the shoes of a smaller company, uh, entrepreneur entering the market, what would you buy? What would be built? How would you spend the 200,000? Um, yeah, I would, I, I don't think I would build a TMS again or even an ERP. Uh, <laughs> I've done that mainly because I didn't know better. I would now really try to find some, I, I would build something that doesn't exist. Um, I can make an example. We've built a tool, we call it instant translation, which is like a chat system for immediate human translation. We didn't see this out in the marketplace. So we could, okay, this is something we can build. No one else has that, or at least we didn't find anyone. And if I would start again, I would also try to find a niche, uh, niche functionality that, that I don't see. Um, no, I think that would be my answer. Do you want to share some of your brilliant ideas, uh, like the instant uh, chat translation, or uh, like? Uh, at this point, <laughs> no, you, I don't you want, want to share to them it. all. <laughs> share one. No. Share one with us. Uh, um, we, 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 with the Fach or like with the university, we started with it's it's a bit of a long running project but we built a tool you can you can you have an existing multilingual website it crawls all the pages it aligns the pages it aligns the text creates translation memory and it extracts the terminology so if you have a new client uh, you basically get like an onboarding package at least that was that was the idea in, in reality, it was a little more complex than we saw than working with universities is also a bit tricky. Um... You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sturz, how would you dispense with 200,000 uh, if you were in, uh, in the situation described uh, be before? Running a translation company is what I call a PPT business. People, you need good people. Second P for processes, you need good processes. And the T is for technology. And a lot of technology that was not around when I started in this industry is around today. So like translation memories, uh, machine translation, these technologies are around. I would rather go ahead and purchase them or develop them in a project like this here with uh, Mark Mittag. Uh, the people obviously are necessary. So that's the second P, the processes. And that's where I would spend most of my money. Uh, the processes usually are very specific. They are specific for our company. They are specific for the customers. And there was one question actually in, uh, in the chat already uh, addressed to myself, uh, where do we use Translate 5 so far? Actually, we did integrate Translate 5 already uh, as a reviewing tool. And that's again, not an issue of developing Translate 5 that was around, but the process, that's what we developed. Our customers have in-country reviewers. So if we, develop, if we translate something into 30, 30 languages, there are 30 in-country reviewers who don't want to hassle around with across or trados, but they need a very clean browser-based service. And that's where we are using Translate 5. And we integrated Translate 5 as a process in our customer review process. 
So that's kind of an answer. My focus would definitely be on processes. That's where I would spend some money. On technology to support the processes, let me clarify. Good. Uh, speaking about money, uh, Mark, I see your first question come in. Uh, and uh, the anonymous attendee is asking you, how do you pay rent when you work with open source? Obviously, if you're uh, open source, it means the software is free, but uh, you have to feed your family. Uh, Maybe before you describe your business uh, model and how you approach this, uh, I will supplement this question with one of mine. Look at WordPress, right? Uh, WordPress is open source, but the company behind it, Automatic, uh, is a gigantic company, right? The same with Drupal. The Drupal core is open source. You can take it, do whatever you want with it, develop around it. But the company be behind it, Aqua, is, uh, is, a, is an IT giant. Can we get more ambitious and uh, really make a lot of money, uh, uh, b build up further on and you know, make a multi-million business behind some open source product in our industry? So, Mark? <laughs> multi-million perhaps, uh, yeah, I would be careful with that because the industry is uh, small, but that's, that's exactly the business model um, that is behind open source yeah, that you, um, earn along the services and especially uh, along integrations uh, of the tools, along um, hosting, along support, um, and that you sell actually also plugins and build custom plugins. Yeah, let's see, you mentioned in our discussions before, for example, the VPML um, plugin for WordPress, which is the, the best um, connector out there. Um, for, for, for translation processes um, and uh, you actually said that it's, um, that it's proprietary software, but that's, that's not true. So any plugin for WordPress has to be under open source license because that's the WordPress license, but still it's sold. So um, it's not out there for free download. Open source does not mean that it's out there for free download. So that's the same what we are doing with Translate 5. There are some sold plugins basically that uh, you are not able to uh, download for free so the, so the hot dog is free but the source is where you uh, pay your rent yeah perhaps you can say it like that yeah and and then the good thing is that anyone out there is able to um, put some different source on the hot dog yeah so um, Remy can decide to um, develop his own source and put it on the hot dog as he did with his instant translate for example that's more than a source, that's, uh, that's a source plus a, plus a package. So um, that's the way you do it with open source. And that's uh, why um, basic technology in, in uh, mature industries is usually open source because um, then you have the, the, source, uh, the, the sausage for free and anyone can uh, spice it the way um, he needs to. And there in the spice then is the money for, for the majority of people who use the software. And in me, of course, for me, of course, the, the money is in uh, maintaining the base for everyone because everyone needs to have some consultancy in that and some further development in that, maybe some plugin which he is not able to write himself, stuff like that. Good. Let's uh, let's go with Adam. Um, my question would be, uh, look, Adam. Uh, we discussed some components that need to be. Um, open source, like the per language morphology stuff. Now I want to reverse the question to you. Imagine uh, you're a translation company. At the moment, there is a big race. Translation companies are going through a digital transformation and the next generation of buyers, they want a translation company which doesn't only have a linguistic expertise, but also has some shiny technology to, sh uh, to, to show. A pitch, I'm offering the highest quality translation in a language XYZ, doesn't work anymore. You have to go to a client and say, look, we have the best, uh, I don't know, AI model for, for this language and it's all that automated. Would you like to see how it's uh, happening? This is kind of what gets the buyer's attention. So naturally, as companies build this kind of offering, they want to be differentiated from their competitors and they want to control that offering. They want to say, only our company has this technology. No one else, I don't know, Tarjama says, we have the best uh, machine translation for Arabic, uh, period, for, uh, and this is why you should work with Which us. they do say. They do say. I don't, it's, a, it's a really good example. We are example. super yeah. cool, uh, automated in uh, post-editing. 
Yesterday I spoke with Flute. They have the same kind of technology that everyone else. Sorry, uh, they have a TMS. They have really advanced machine translation. They sell translation services, right? They want to control, uh, although the components in there might be, uh, some of them might be open source, but uh, controlling means that uh, you are boosting your valuation. And when you've built your company and you want to sell it, it's much better to sell a software company than to sell a services company. Now, the question is, where do you think is the, um, is this, uh, the, 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 this division between, uh, in the mind of the of the owner, where they should open source and let go, and what do they should keep to make sure that they are making their company valuable. Maybe you could start, and maybe you could uh, uh, provide your perspective after Adam. Mm -hmm. So, it's a it's an interesting question. Um, the one thing that I hear a lot when we were, we work with LSPs, right? And you don't normally hear an LSP cursing an LSP of the same size. You normally hear an LSP cursing a much bigger LSP, 10 X bigger roughly, right? Or more. Um, so in my mind, um, the clear thing would be like, Hey, if these guys, uh, this is the non-creative idea, right? It's like, okay, the big word or, um, you know, line bridge, transfer effect or whatever are doing this, we could not possibly afford to spend a billion dollars on this, but with a, you know, 10 or 100 other LSPs, we can do something. That's, you know, that's uh, the obvious one. So what are these guys doing right now? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of this uh, sort of MT plus stuff, right? So do we know how good the MT was? Like, what do we do, right? Risk prediction. Um, can we, for example, extract uh, automatically terminology out of all the TMs that we do? Could we do automatic uh, post editing, right? So, so not just saying, hey, this is good or bad, but like, how, should, how would you fix it? Um, now, uh, what's not just good or bad at the sentence level, but at the word level, right? This is the word, that's the problem. Um, so this is what the translation company should keep and never give to a co-petitor, uh, no matter how much we discuss that open source is good. Hey, if I might add something to that. Uh, Curiosity is everything. Sorry. I think uh, Adam has uh, frozen a little bit. Right, Mark? Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah I, uh, now he's back. Good. Adam, you froze a little bit, but I guess your uh, uh, response was yes. Uh, keep the, the this logic uh, no. for your business. <laughs> no, no, right. that's... Remy, you, be, I, you, you I pick mean, up. Can, what I'm can saying I say is, something? It... <laughs> Dr. Schurz, please go ahead. 15 years ago, we had a piece of software which we developed for a few thousand bucks only. And at a certain point of time, a co-predator asked us whether he could have this software. I said, okay, let's give it away. And at the end of the day, we decided not to give it away, but to sell it to this guy. And he didn't buy it because he said that's too expensive. And the funny thing is it was only six or eight weeks later, I believe, maybe 10 weeks later, that this piece of software was available as open source in the market anyway. So my competitive edge was gone after 10 weeks. And if I have a special technology today, I can bet that my competitive edge is gone to gone at least at the latest next year. I will lose this competitive edge. So my competitive edge is not technology anymore. It's people and processes. Uh, let me give you one example, one analogy. Uh, it's a lot of money involved there, but this Formula One car racing business. A lot of people don't know. Mercedes is running this business and their champions have been champions over the last years. Six of their competitors are using Mercedes-Benz engines, Mercedes-Benz engines for their cars. So the cars are different, the process is different, the people are different, the maintenance people are different, but the engine is the same. So I'm not winning in this business because I have a better technology. I'm winning because I have better processes and better people. And that's why I don't really worry about sharing technology. That's my five cents. Rebi, would you like to contribute? Um, I mean, I, I think uh, Dr. Schultz definitely has a point there. Uh, maybe I would extend it and say integrating people 
processes and technology is where what what, what makes the, the final the final cut um yeah in individual small technology pieces yeah i mean especially if uh, at our size building something that uh, I don't know, uh, smartling or whoever could not uh, copy is, is, is indeed very difficult. But maybe if the niche is small enough, uh, you can hope that they wouldn't jump in there. But if, as, 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 if you combine all these things nicely, I think there you definitely have an advantage. And, and also maybe, I mean, we can, we can talk about machine translation and I don't know, super high tech technology. But if I look at some of our clients, uh, the, 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 the processes or the, the way they work with translation is, is sometimes so archaic and so inefficient. Um, just having like a, a simple export and even doing all manual export, manual import, you can already improve efficiency dramatically. Um, and and, and uh, this is no, but if to maybe answer your, your question a little more general, I think like infrastructure pieces of software, uh, that are somewhat generic. Yeah, I'm super happy to share, or like, or maybe not to share, but uh, support an open source project that that builds them. Because um, yeah, it, it's it, I mean, it, it makes absolutely no sense that I build a translation memory myself. Or so we we did make the mistake of actually building a terminology tool <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> like like pretty much everybody that was on the list there, I think everybody likes to build a terminology tool because you figure, oh, it's it's simple to build and most of the tools that are on the market are maybe a bit too complex for the clients. But if it was a worthwhile, in, I mean, actually our, and the tool that we built ourselves wasn't even fantastically good. So that is maybe not something I would repeat. But general the German space is famous for building terminology tools. It, it's yeah, the, I think... <laughs> Uh, it's the alma mater of all the terminology tools in the world. By the way, we have a question about terminology coming from Professor Alan Melby. Uh, the question is long and detailed. I will read the last part of it. The, uh, is there a need uh, for a new terminology interchange standard, something open source uh, that everyone will comply with right now? Um, would you like to answer that? Uh, Dr. Sturz, Remy, Mark, uh, Adam, who, who, who has an opinion on the subject? Uh, my answer would be no. I think TBX is good enough. Any other opinions? I agree. So it's good enough. All right. <laughs> good. Um, Mr. Melby, thank you for your question. That was a, pro pro probably a very definitive answer. All right, if there are no more questions, we can maybe sum it up, right? Uh, Mark, why don't you sum up? Uh, uh, why don't you give a quick recap of what we have learned today? Okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm unmuted, okay. Um, so I think an important part uh, of, uh, of, of the panel is that uh, it makes definitely sense to build um, tool that is main infrastructure in based on open source. And um, then the important question would be, what is that for the upcoming new technology out there? And there, um, one point I would like to add is, um, I watched your panel, um, uh, your, your first panel, Constantine, and uh, all the companies there said, oh, we had to build our own tools for this uh, data mining purposes and for, um, for marking different kind of strings for AI to learn from and so on. So all these companies again build their own tools. And now these, these are bigger companies and this technology now goes down to the more smaller companies and they for sure will not be all of them able to build their own tools. But uh, it's a need there in the market that, uh, and it's also technology from the technology side possible that this goes more down to smaller companies and more down to the local market, um, as Manuel Herranz from Pandrianic said in, in the panel. So there is a big opportunity to build these tools also in open source, or maybe even to, to extend existing open source tools for some aspects like Translate 5 to be able to do these kind of uh, this kind of stuff. But um, this kind of stuff is not only text related, it also has a lot of different aspects. So that, that, that is a, uh, an area where I think that, that really would, uh, would make sense for someone who um, would like to, to go in this direction. So um, 
And I'm pretty happy so to... Everything uh, under the hood that we need uh, for NLP and for the data services and for the next services to come up uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in this uh, five years, it's better to build it as an open source because otherwise we'll end up as with the story with Adobe Experience Manager connector, right? 80 parallel connectors, how do you choose from one? Is any of them working? Are any of them working, right? So let's escape this redundant development. Let's focus our efforts. Everything which is under the hood, which is not exposed to the clients can be open source. Everything which is... Uh, 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 make your company unique even um, using some of the components. But Constantine, uh, you were, weren't able to hear in the last two sentences, but um, yeah, so it, uh, it's good to do everything that is basic, basically as open source, and then you even have the opportunity, um, if you do it in, in the right way and you have enough companies who, who contribute, you can even be uh, faster in, uh, in regard of um, development and regard of, of new features. And uh, you have the, then the chance to, to be the, uh, the, the basic sausage or the basic engine in, in the Formula One, basically. So, um, all right. So. There we have it. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, providing your opinions and participating in this panel. I hope that the uh, attendees have heard interesting stuff and insights to use in their business and to consider what they could do with $200,000 uh, uh, if they have them available to build new technology. I hope in the future there'll be more concerted effort to build new technology uh, and more collaboration between the companies. Gala always had the TAPIC uh, initiative under their wing. Maybe more initiatives like this will appear. And good luck building. Um, I think it's fascinating to build a new technology teams and processes that can develop this new technology, as Dr. Schultz have pointed out. Thank you very much and have a great third day of the conference. Thank you for hosting us. Easton, please take it from here. Thank you very much, Konstantin. Thank you very much, dear panelists, and thank you very much, Konstantin. This has been very insightful. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I believe that it was also very much in line with uh, the conference theme, which is evolutions and revolutions. And I hope to hear more about this. And also, I would love to hear more about uh, how open source works, because that's one thing that for me, coming from the commercial software area is, has always been a question, because there are also many legal aspects of that with, with all the different uh, licensing perspectives which I would love to, to hear, hear more about how it can work in our industry.